Take out your Bibles and turn to Hebrews 11, page 1874 and 1875. Hebrews 11. So our theme today is on faith, and um, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, is the chapter with the most times of the word faith in it. It's used 30 times. Isn't that amazing? In 30 verses, 30 times. More than any other book. Anybody want to guess what the second book, book, not chapter, that uses the term faith the most is? It's in the New Testament. Good guess, Romans, Romans. So let us read the first seven verses of this. And um, as you know, the, whole, the chapter goes on all the way through the Old Testament, but we'll just read the first seven verses. Would you join me? Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man, when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he wards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. He condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And we'll stop there. Now turn to Luke chapter 17, if you would, page um, 1627. Luke 17, page 1627. So today we are uh, celebrating the ministry of the Lutheran Women's Missionary League and our verses are part of the assigned reading for the day, okay? And they talk about increasing our faith. And I wanna talk about faith today and I've never come at a sermon like this before. So uh, you're the experiment. We'll see how it goes, okay? So let's read chapter 17. We're going to start with verse 3, the paragraph, if your brother sins, and we'll do that paragraph through verse 6, okay? Would you join me? If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you, says, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. We're going to stop there. So the, you can keep your Bibles open. The first part of the sermon has to do with saving faith faith, okay? And I want to differentiate, I, and we'll come to that in a little bit in the second part, what does Jesus, or what do the disciples mean, Lord, increase our faith, and what does it mean when Jesus says to them, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed? So first of all, we're going to focus on saving faith. I want to remind you today that we are saved by grace, through faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody got that? We're not saved by faith through grace. We are saved by grace 
through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And historically, there are three components of saving faith. Does anybody remember this? It's in your catechism, people. It's in the catechism. Three components of saving faith. Okay, the first is knowledge of divine grace. Saving faith, first of all, requires a knowledge of what God has done for me through the person of Jesus Christ and through his death and his resurrection. Okay, everybody understand that? There has to be some knowledge there of what Christ has done for me. But secondly, one must not only know it, but one must accept it as the truth. Part of faith is accepting what Christ has done as the truth, that he was a historical character, that he came into this world, that he lived in this world, and that he died and rose again. So first of all, you have to have knowledge, then acceptance of it being true. But that's not saving faith. The Bible says we should have used that passage. Even the devil knows about the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the devil accepts as true that he was true man and that he died and rose again from the dead. So what is the third element of saving faith? The third element of saving faith is when one trusts and places his or her life into the hands of God because of what Christ has done for me. And I, let me just go through these words. I went through this list of words that describe this, this trust, okay? Saving faith has the confidence. It has the assurance, the reliance, the security, and the trust that Jesus is my personal Savior who gave up his life for me. And I put my life into his hands. You know what the um, Latin word for this is? Fiducia. F-I-D-U-C-I-A. We use that term in fiducial uh, person who finances has to have your welfare in mind. That's fiducia. Fiducia is that personal relationship with Jesus that I receive and accept him for my salvation. He isn't just a thought out there. It's not just a nice ritual thing. It is the reality that I trust and put my life into his hands. Everybody understand that? And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The last part of this faith business is that the Holy Spirit works in me and draws me to the gospel to receive in faith what Jesus has done for me. That's conversion. That's regeneration. Where you and I are converted, we are regenerated and made alive now in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that makes it personal. One of the things I really worry about in American Christianity, and, and I think I see this and it worries me, is that for a lot of American Christians, their Christianity is externals. It's the rituals of the day. And it's not that personal relationship that I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for my salvation. All right? And every believer has this kind of saving faith. You and I share that saving faith with believers, only believers, around the world. No matter what continent, no matter what language, no matter what culture, all of us have that basic, as believers, saving faith. And here's the deal. No one of us has more saving faith than the other. Everybody got that? Either you have it or you do not. All right.
part two of the sermon. So in our verses for today, the disciples say, Lord, increase our faith. Well, there are several occasions where Jesus barks at his disciples and Peter and says, O ye of little faith. And he's frustrated with them. So what is that? What kind of faith is that? Now, the imagery of the mustard seed and as faith as small as a mustard seed, and you can say to that mulberry tree, jump, go into the sea. In my preparation for this, there were so many people that I read who said, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to see? Jesus doesn't expect this to happen. This is a hyperbole. You know what a hyperbole is? I, yes, thank you. It's almost a shock effect. Jesus isn't saying, well, if you had faith, so why don't you go tell that mulberry tree to jump into the lake or the ocean? No, he's not saying that at all. What he's saying is he's using that as example of how great faith can be and what great things faith can do. And the other thing that is behind this is not the mulberry tree moving. It is what would happen at Pentecost when the disciples are empowered by the Spirit. And think of this. They took that gospel to the ends of the earth earth, to India, to Africa, to, a, to Europe. And isn't that amazing that these men who Jesus is angry with and says, you have little faith, but God has, faith has power because God has power in faith. All right. So what kind of faith is this? It's not saving faith. It's a living faith. It's a living faith that engages the struggles of life and the challenges of life every morning when you get up. One of the examples before us is if your brother sins seven times, comes and says, I'm sorry, you should forgive him seven times. Okay? This faith is not saving faith. It is the result of saving faith at work in your life and mine by the power of the Holy Spirit. I got some names for it. It is a living faith that every believer has that we struggle with every day. It is an active exercise of our faith. It embraces the promises of God and it faces the challenges of the day. Not alone, but with the power of God, and we look at life through the eyes of faith. Everybody understand that? One of the phrases I found, it's a lifelong journey of discovery. I like that one. That faith is a lifelong journey of discovery of what God can do in you and through you. All right? Let me finish this out. The Holy Spirit, if you go back to your catechism, under faith, okay? The Holy Spirit creates a renewal of my life. In my thoughts, my desires, my attitudes, my will, and my behavior. That is the life of the journey of faith. The journey of discovery that each of us is engaged in. All right, everybody got that? So how's your faith? <laughs> the point is, our faith is on a roller coaster. Thank God that we are not saved by faith. I've said that so many times. Because saving faith is a constant. You understand that? That's a gift of God. That's the power of God unto salvation through which I now have come into a personal relationship with Jesus. But as I apply that faith in my life, it's going up and down, up and down. And there truly are people, a lot of days, when Jesus is saying to you and me, what the heck is wrong with you, O oh, you of little faith? And he doesn't want us to have blind faith. 
You know, some people think that's what faith is. Well, I blindly believe. Oh, no. You use the gifts, the talents, the thoughts, the abilities you have. Not blind faith, but courageous faith. And herein, we have to learn something. I think a lot of us are very pragmatic. We have any, um, what do you call those people that deal with money? Accountants. Accountants. They're very pragmatic people, aren't they? Everything, the numbers all have to fit, right? And if it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. The problem with that, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the problem with that is God works beyond numbers. God works beyond things. And many times in our lives, personally, and in the life of the church, it is a leap of faith. We use that term, don't we? Not the, end, the end doesn't look good. You know, when this congregation, we were having this conversation the other day, when this congregation began that preschool 35 years ago, that was a leap of faith for this congregation. There was a lot of opposition. And the primary one was what? Financial. But if you don't put it out there, if you don't let God have a shot at it, whether it's successful or not, that's the point. And I want to say that for your personal life. If God challenges you to witness to someone and you have such little faith you can't do it, that you, that's not right. And we need to understand that corporately but also individually. That our attitude has to be if God puts me here and he opens a door, we walk through it. Whether, it, whether we're successful or not, it's kind of like having children or have, being married to a certain degree. All right, last part of the sermon is this. So let God increase your faith. How does that happen? I got three things. I'm sure there's more, but a three is always nice. First of all, have a desire for your faith to increase, okay? Don't be a person who's lazy in faith and says, oh, I don't care, you know. I don't have enough faith to do that. <laughs> I've heard that a few times in ministry. I don't have enough faith to do that. And, and be a person who cares, okay? Pray, Lord, increase my faith. Pray the prayer. I'll finish the sermon with that, all right? Give me the words to say. Give me the energy. Give me the trust, all right? Number two, resort back to the origin and source of your faith. And that's Almighty God. And where does he come into your life? Through his word and his sacraments, right? And I'm convinced a lot of us don't have faith because the word is not part, this Bible is not part much of our lives. And when the Bible is part of your life, you, you, your faith grows. Because like Hebrews 11, that whole chapter is on what? People who trusted God and it worked out. Okay? Like Abraham, like Noah, like whoever. Joseph, thank you. Yes. So the scriptures and the sacrament are huge. Okay? And I'm convinced that the lack thereof ruins our faith. But thirdly, respond to the challenges of faith in your life. You and I are challenged in faith. We're challenged by that neighbor who lives down the street or across the street. We're challenged by whatever's going on in this world. We are challenged. And step up in faith. Not blind faith, not timid faith, not shallow faith but in strong faith, trusting, and you're going to make mistakes, and that's okay, but trusting that the Lord is with you. So finally, pray this prayer. Lord, increase my faith. And I want you to pray that prayer this morning when you come up to Holy Communion. When you come up to Communion, I want to put this on you. Pray, Lord, increase my faith. And maybe there's an area of your life that needs some increasing in that faith. In Jesus' name.